Hi and welcome to today's live chapter reading of 10 Days by KG Holiday, courtesy of Itsy Bitsy Book Bits. Chapter 1 He couldn't believe he had agreed to this. It was official. Alex had gone completely out of his mind. You need to experience outdoors in order to write a compelling main character who is a survivalist, they said. We went camping every summer as kids and we know everything there is to know about outdoors, they said. It will be fun, they said. Yeah, right. Yeah, fucking right. The drive to wherever this adventure was going to take place was taking an unnatural amount of time. Couldn't they put nature somewhere convenient? Like next to a diner? If he didn't know Luke any better, he might think that the soulless ginger bastard was taking him up into the mountains to kill him. It's not like threats had not been made when certain people, <coughs> Alex, <coughs> beat other certain people, <coughs> Look <coughs> at Gears of War for the millionth time. In Alex's defence, Luke had the tactical skills of a fucking Neanderthal. That's why he was pretty sure this survivalist thing was going to be a cakewalk. He, after all, had deductive reasoning on his side. So much so he was able to ju deduce by the looks of the road they'd been winding on for the better part of two hours, they were likely to come to the junction of bumfuck and you've got a purdy mouth. It was an ungodly hour in an ungodly, ungodly uncomfortable back seat with an ungodly lack of coffee. He slouched in the seat of the station wagon, his beanie pulled so far down it was nearly covering his eyes. He could feel the heaviness of his lids as he leaned against the ancient panelled door. If he was really going to have to be subjected to a car ride for a decade, it was only fair that he was allowed a nap. The last time he saw this side of 6am, well, he wasn't sure he'd ever seen this side of it. 6am's were only seen when he'd found himself in a particularly productive groove at the keyboard. Sometimes writing was like pressing razor blades into his skin, and try and try as he might, he couldn't put enough pressure down to break. Other times it was like turning on a faucet. The words poured from his fingertips at a pace no human could possibly keep up with. He, of all people, would never allow himself to willingly wake up at this time. No respectable writer would. A familiar heavenly scent filled his nostrils and he cracked a single eye opened. He was met with a rainbow of forest green, specifically the long, thick lashes framing expressive meadow eyes. Attached to it was a girl with blonde hair pulled tightly into a ponytail at the top of her head and a cupid's bow mouth that seemed to be stained permanently red. Penny Foster was twisted around in the passenger seat of the car, extending a cup of coffee towards him. Steam emitted from the metal container and he had both the urge to cry for joy and propose marriage. Wait, where did the coffee even come from? Was this woman a witch? As he let his gaze take in the rest of her, grey sweater, faded jeans, light rain jacket, incredible body, he thought she just might be. He pulled himself up, extending his hands to wrap around the preferred cup. His fingers brushed hers, but he didn't let her warm skin stop him. Are you carrying around a coffee machine under your jacket that you didn't tell me about? He grumbled, bringing the rim of the cup to his mouth and taking a swig. His eyes closed as a luminous taste of bean permeated his tear buds. Dear God, thank you. Thank you for bestowing coffee upon this earth and delivering it to me in this moment. I will forever be indebted to you. Forever your slave. Dear God, as an intellectual, please also realise he was completely full of shit. He reopened his eyes to find Penny looking at him in amusement. She arched one golden eyebrow before lifting a large metal canister into his line of sight. A thermos. Bless this woman. He shouldn't have been surprised at her forethought. Penny Foster was everything but underprepared. The first time Alex Jones had met her was a month after he'd started at NYU. Luke and he had been placed together in the dorms, and despite the fact that Luke, with his easy personality and boyish good looks, was the complete opposite of Alex in every single way they had, up until that point, not tried to kill each other. They weren't exactly friends yet, but they weren't exactly not friends either. Alex respected Luke was working his football scholarship in order to study music. In the four weeks they had cohabited together, he'd learned four things. One, Luke fucking sucked at video games. Two, 
Apparently his dad owned a construction company. Three, picking up his laundry was an unknown activity. Four, and the guy got more pussy than the rest of the dorm combined. He wasn't kidding either. In a month, Alec had seen more women walk through their dorm door than the revolving door at Macy's. Alex had to hand it to him. Luke had mad game. However, it was kind of hard to focus on his work when a headboard was constantly smacking against the composite of the dorm wall. It's not that he didn't like women. He loved women. He'd met plenty of girls over the years he found to be pretty, even beautiful. He liked the softness of them, the ease of their smiles, and the tranquility of inner peace he'd never been able to master. Women were creatures he didn't think he'd ever truly understand. Sure, he'd dated. He'd more than dated. But he wasn't interested in a woman solely for what was underneath her shirt. Finding a woman whose best feature was not located whose best feature was located inside of her skull and not pushed into a push-up bra. That deemed to be a little harder sell. At least it was for him. The day he'd met the blonde in question, he'd unlocked his dorm room just like any other, except for one thing. He'd been pissed off. His lip professor had given him a bad mark on a paper, he'd spent an insane amount of time editing, and the prospect of having such a bad grade so early in his first year was enough to send him into a downward spiral. He had ripped his messenger bag over his head, tossed his keys, wherever the hell they landed, and was about to fall face first onto his bed when he got sight of a figure. She was sitting cross-legged on Luke's surprisingly made bed. Jesus Christ, not again, he'd muttered. If the girl had heard him, she hadn't let his words or his clearly irritated tone faze her. You must be Alexander, she chirped happily, extending her hand and giving him a genuinely pleased smile. Luke's told me about you. I'm Penny. He eyed her hand as if it had the potential to give him Ebola. They stood like that, awkwardly for a minute, then two, before he reached out and shook her hand lightly. He had to say she wasn't like the usual girls Luke brought home. The first indication was she was wearing clothes. A simple long knee v-neck shirt, jeans and Ked sneakers so white they could have been brand new. Her hair was pulled up out of her face and her face, well, she was actually quite pretty. Pretty in the I'm not trying too hard because who gives a fuck what you think kind of way. And he liked that. He really liked that. It was a shame she was there for Luke, he thought. Of course, until Luke opened the door and introduced him to Penny Foster, childhood next door neighbour and resident best friend. Seven years had passed since then, and though Penny and his path had crossed more times than he could count since that fateful day in October, he couldn't call the two of them close. They had a singular thing in common, that they were both friends with Luke. They weren't best friends by any means, but they weren't acquaintances either. They were more friend adjacent. Definition aside, it didn't stop Alex from knowing things about her. They shared their best friends for fuck's sake, and over the course of knowing someone for seven years, it was easy to pick up certain bits of knowledge about one's character. Things Alexander Jonathan Jones knew about Penelope Foster. 1. She was fucking brilliant. Like next level Bobby Fisher-esque brilliant. She graduated with honours from Columbia a year early and was one of the youngest resident journalists on salary at the New York Times. Her work was good. The kind of good that won Pulitzers. As someone who also wrote, and was published, thank you very much, it was high praise. 2. She was a goddamn saint. It wasn't just that she willingly put up with Luke for her entire life. She put up with Alec when they crossed paths, and her family, which according to Luke was the equivalent of watching a train crash into a shit show. Between the drama associated with her sister's teenage pregnancy, with a man whose family was the Foster's equivalent of the Montagues, the hate crime committing grandfather, the obsessed for Stepford monstrosity masquerading as a mother, and the illegitimate brother that came out of the woodwork when they were all teenagers, it was a miracle Penny was able to put a smile on her face. She did more than just smile. She was unfailingly kind to everyone she met. She was an <clears throat> she was perky and optimistic and just so fucking likeable. If someone were to put Alexander Jones on a spectrum next to Penny Foster, 
he was sure they would be on polar and complete opposite ends of it. 3. She was prepared for everything. It was not only that she could manifest coffee out of a tear in the fabric of the space-time continuum. No, once when Luke had forgotten to bring a toothbrush on a weekend trip to the Hamptons, she had extras. She was legitimately carrying extra brand new toothbrushes in her suitcase, as if that was something normal people did all the time. Her over-preparedness didn't stop at all material base essentials either. She was basically the, hu- the human equivalent of a vending machine. The woman baked like there was no tomorrow, and she didn't even have the audacity to be bad at it. Her cookies were delightful, her muffins to die for. Don't even get him started on her meatloaf. She was a, cur- a culinary savant, and with his appetite, it was the biggest compliment he could possibly give her. She always carried food with her, and a testament to number two in his list, she always, and without fail, offered something to him. To his credit, he'd only asked her to marry him three times so far, out of the countless delicious and indescribable snacks later, and he, he'd been impressed that was all. Four, she cared entirely too much for people. Enough that even someone as socially inept as him had noticed, Penny wore her heart on her sleeve the same way she wore her brilliant smile on her face. She was a vivid ray of sunshine throughout the monotonous, gloomy clouds of everyday life. She loved helping people. She loved making people feel special. The thing he noticed both consistently and unbelievably was that the people around her, the people who had been fortunate direction intentionally, he hoped, it was little, little things. She never failed to make sure Luke had groceries in his fridge when she came over. When they'd been in college, she came over and picked up the room. Luke went along with a blind eye, as if his laundry was just magically doing itself. Alex had even watched as she, who had been volunteered by her cousin Charlotte to organise a fundraiser, ran herself ragged for weeks without even a thank you. He never understood how she put up with it, how the others didn't realise what they were doing. He counted her lucky he wasn't close enough to land underneath enough penny even deigned to look at it in their took for her um, for granted. Not overtly, not even the umbrella of people she cared about. She didn't need to look after another person, let alone him. Five, she was beautiful. Once he'd gotten to know her a little bit, he found her insanely, completely, indescribably beautiful. He'd noticed that when he'd first met her, had lamented she had been there to see Luke back when he'd believed she was there solely to jump between the sheets. It wasn't until later, when he realised she fell under off-limits sister status, that he let himself observe her more closely. She had a quiet beauty, the kind that subtly kept you enraptured. She hardly ever wore makeup, and when she did, it was just enough to enhance her already stunning features. He understood women weren't objects, and was the first to prefer strongly worded soliloquies on the topic. The real reason to engage in the constructs of the mating ritual called modern day dating was because of what was inside a woman's mind, not what was on her face or her body. Her body though. Hey, he was human. She was human. And the human part of Alex really, really noticed the human part of Penny. He was cognizant, however, of one of the important things. She was millions of miles out of his league. Okay, he'd published The Overpass, a murder mystery novel based off true life events. Yeah, it'd been marginally successful. He was even engaging on this nightmare trip into the boonies in order to meet the impending deadline of the first draft of his next book. Not solely for the integrity of artistic expression, but more because if he wasn't able to finish it within the next two months, his editor would track him down and commit homicide. Straight up ice pick shoved through the nasal cavity. His editor's words, but Alex was in the the midst of an extreme case of lighter's block, hence the desperate measures into the unforgiving wilderness, and Penny Foster. With her pretty eyes and happy heart, well, she wasn't for him. He wasn't stupid. He knew he wasn't the conventional choice for women. He was broody, preferred to solitude, drank entirely too much coffee, smoked the occasional cigarette, and would rather stay at home with a good book than go out and get lit. Even without the awkward personality traits that were more than enough to scare off the fairer sex, 
the tragic protagonist's backstory didn't help things either. He couldn't decide which was worse, his father being a convict or a gang leader. Not that he had the opportunity to choose, as the two were tied together. His convict stroke gang leader father didn't quite sell him to women. Neither did his mother and little sister somewhere out there in the witness protection programme. Coupled with the ink staining the skin of his arm, all his childhood proves what it doesn't matter how far a person ran from their circumstances, fate had a way of finding everyone.